trying to find the right words to express what 2020 is. Horror mixed with hope, shock mixed with an internal acknowledgement that this has risen to the surface after years of tension, patience, attempts at sounding the alarm. This feels like the kind of year that will go down in history books. We already know that's the case. I have mostly stuck to subjects that affect me as a queer white person on this channel, but I can't stay silent about this. This isn't a time where we should silently nod. Uh, I must confess that over the last few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regret of a conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block and the stride towards freedom is not the white citizen council or the Ku Klux Klan but the white modern who is more devoted to order than a justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. This quote may not be familiar to a lot of people, as since his death, King and his body of writing have been largely whitewashed, apparently to make his overall message of equality more palatable to white people. The fact is, racism is not just about saying the N-word or carrying out deliberately malicious acts against non-white people out of hatred or xenophobia. Racism is a system, and there are so many different ways that the system is upheld. I don't know if we have ever experienced uh, of this kind of global challenge to racism and to the consequences of slavery and colonialism. Before I ramble about various things, I need to say that right now is an extremely important time to listen, and not only to people who look like me. You need to be listening to black people. I can already hear some people thinking, but Candace Owens, you can't just say listen to black people. I think it's kind of strange to automatically uh, jump to people like Candace Owens to counter the idea that black people should be centred when it comes to talking about anti-blackness. What I mean to say here is that if your opinion about what is happening right now is not informed by the people the most affected by it, it will always, always be a superficial analysis. What I'm not doing is generalising and saying that simply being black is enough to warrant unquestioning agreement. I don't automatically presume that's what people mean when they say, you should listen to more black people. But I know some people do. I often think of this painting at the moment by Jean-Michel Basquiat. The police hat seems to form a cage around the black policeman's head. The few words that he included in the painting say it all. It looks as if the system cannot reform itself. We've tried black faces in high places. Too often our black politicians, professional class, middle class, become too accommodated to the capitalist economy, too accommodated to the militarized nation state, too accommodated to the market-driven culture tied with celebrity status, power, fame, all of that superficial stuff that means so much to so many fellow citizens. We got a neo-fascist gangster in the White House who really doesn't care for the most part. You got a neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party that is now in the driver's seat and they don't really know what to do because all they want is show more black faces, show more black faces. So that when you talk about the masses of black people, the precious poor and working class black people, poor and working class brown, red, yellow, whatever color, they're the ones who are left out and they feel so thoroughly powerless, helpless, hopeless, then you get rebellion. And we've reached the point now, it's a choice between non-violent revolution, and by revolution what I mean is the democratic sharing of power, resources, wealth, and respect. If we don't get that kind of sharing, you're going to get more violent explosions. Now the sad thing is, in this neo-fascist moment in the White House, you got some neo-fascist brothers and sisters out there who are already armed. They show up there at the U.S. Capitol, and they don't get arrested, they don't get put down. 
Breonna Taylor, shot eight times in her own bed, murdered by the police. Her boyfriend was charged with attempted murder for firing back at the cops who failed to identify themselves after they shot Breonna eight times. The public lynching of George Floyd, which would have been swept under the rug if a brave 17-year-old named Darnella Frazier hadn't filmed every second of it. Tony McDade, a trans man, murdered on May 27th. You should be outraged. We should be outraged. Racism isn't just our history. It's also our present. It's everywhere, and it's time to face the fact that white supremacy is not a bug in our society. It's a feature. Just check out this clip from a channel called Left Click TV. Hey, Sudha! What happened to your face? तुम्हें चाहिए नाइन एक्स चेहरे पे रौनक लाइए सिर्फ नौ सेकेंड में फॉरेन पासपोर्ट ऐसा ही मैम तुम की कह रहे हो जी आज ही नाइन एक्स अपनाइए Yikes! 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 You don't need me to tell you how fucked up that is, and how it's a remnant of British colonialism and white supremacy. Yikes, indeed. And speaking of yikes, we're going to have to talk about Donald Trump. Before I start talking about Trump, I don't want anyone to presume that I am saying that Barack Obama, for example, was a good president. The U.S. has a long history of white supremacy and violence that did not start under Trump. Powerful continuing nationalism, identifying enemies and scapegoats as a unifying cause, rampant sexism, obsession with national security, corporate power is protected, disdain for the intellectuals and the arts, rampant cronyism and corruption, disdain for recognizing human rights, supremacy of the military, controlled mass media, labor power is suppressed, fraudulent elections, religion and government are intertwined, obsession with crime and punishment. Look no further than Stephen Miller. He is Trump's senior adviser, and he's a far-right conservative, an anti-immigrationist, and known white supremacist. Hate Watch exposed the racist source material that has influenced his visions of policy. That source material includes white nationalist websites, a white genocide-themed novel that applauds xenophobic conspiracy theories and eugenics-era immigration laws that Adolf Hitler lauded in Mein Kampf. Miller sent a story from the white nationalist website V Dare in 2015. This website traffics in the white genocide or great replacement myth, which suggests that non-white people are systematically and deliberately wiping white people off of the planet. This is a myth based on hatred, driven by panic that's often called white extinction anxiety. This conspiracy theory exists solely to scare white people. The theory was popularized by a white supremacist neo-Nazi. I realize all of this is awful, but it's important to understand that it's real and it's happening. Pretending that it's not there is not going to help. Keeping this in mind, think of the coronavirus crisis happening right now. That's been happening for months. The handling of it, especially in the U.S., has been absolutely awful. The people the most affected by the virus are poor black people, and the way that the government has nonchalantly positioned themselves as not giving a shit about the people dying shouldn't be described as simple incompetence. I'm not sure that that can be used as an excuse when we are dealing with white supremacists. Incompetence is not an excuse that we can keep using. Okay, I get it. Some people probably think that I sound like a conspiracy theorist. Dog whistles are named that way because of dog whistles in sheep herding, an ultrasound whistle that only the dog can hear. But in this case, the dog whistles aren't being used to communicate with dogs; they're being used to communicate with Nazis. There have been quite a few dog whistles recently, and dog whistles are so effective because two people who are maybe a little less aware, people talking about these dog whistles, would just seem a little bit irrational and out of touch. A tinfoil hat leftist, and that's exactly what they want you to think.
That is why dog whistles are so effective. People who are in tune to what they mean know that they're real. But for people who aren't in tune to these dog whistles and people who just don't know what to look out for, people like me who talk about them, we look like the conspiracy theorists. Let's uh, let's talk about some examples. Trump's using the same symbol as used in Nazi concentration camps to talk about political opponents. Nah, you're just reading too far into it. It's just an arrow, right? Trump's selling shirts using a redesigned Nazi symbol. The resemblance there is purely coincidental. Trump's retweeting a white power video. Um, well, he must have had the volume turned off. That's why he just didn't realize, right? Trump's selling commemorative baseballs for $88. His team put out 88 adverts that all started with 14 words. A federal agency said it lost track of 1,488 migrant children. Surely just a coincidence that it's that exact number. Multiple cops have been recorded deliberately flashing the white power sign in front of cameras. The Trump administration erases trans health protections on the anniversary of the Pulse shooting. Another coincidence? I am mobilizing all available federal resources, civilian and military, to stop the rioting and looting, to end the destruction and arson, and to protect the rights of law-abiding Americans, including your Second Amendment rights. This reference to the Second Amendment is a bit strange. The, the protests don't have anything to do with the Second Amendment. And then you realize that the Second Amendment was at least partially created to ensure that slave owners had the right to arm slave patrols in order to control uprisings amongst the enslaved. This is another dog whistle. One of the most shocking and awful dog whistles that Trump has done recently was organizing a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth. Tulsa is the site of the Black Wall Street Massacre, and Juneteenth is a holiday celebrating the emancipation of those who were enslaved in the US. It is no coincidence that this location and this date were chosen for the first Trump rally in months. Here's Kim Latrice Jones talking about economics and racism in the US, explaining how important Tulsa was to the black community. Let me explain to you something about economics in America. Economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. Do you understand that? Now, if I right now, if I right now decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you and for 400 rounds of playing Monopoly, I didn't allow you to have any money. I didn't allow you to have anything on the board. I didn't allow for you to have anything. And then we played another 50 rounds of Monopoly and everything that you gained and you earned while you were playing that round of Monopoly was taken from you. That was Tulsa, that was Rosewood. Those are places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our stores, where we owned our property and they burned them to the ground so that's 450 years so for 400 rounds of monopoly you don't get to play at all not only do you not get to play you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against you have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them so then for 50 years, you finally get a little bit and you're allowed to play. And every time that they don't like the way that you're playing or that you're catching up or that you're doing something to be self-sufficient, they burn your game. They burn your cards. They burn your monopoly money. And then finally at the release and the onset of that, they allow you to play and they say, okay, now you catch up. Now at this point, the only way you're gonna catch up in the game is if the person shares the wealth, correct? But what if every time you share the wealth, then there's psychological warfare against you to say, oh, you're an equal opportunity higher. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played, if you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it like they did in Tulsa and like they did in Rosewood. How can you win? How can you win? If you still think that every single example that I've cited here is pure coincidence, you're starting to sound more like a conspiracy theorist than I do. Would you like to, uh, would you like to 
to borrow this. Police raided a gay bar on the first day of Pride Month. Black people are being found hanging from trees. ICE detention camps are poisoning the people that they're detaining with some chemical called HDQ neutral being sprayed every 15 minutes. The human beings being detained in these camps are referred to as illegal aliens by the US government. Black Americans are dying from COVID-19 at three times the rate of white people. One in 2,000 black Americans has died from the virus. White supremacy and eugenics go hand in hand. Please consider the fact that white supremacists and people who dabble in eugenics are currently in power during a global pandemic, a deadly virus that could wipe out a lot of people. Who gets to make that decision whether somebody's quality of life, if they have a disability, well, it's definitely not me. quality of life is not good? And, and, I'm, and I don't mean to be frank or, or racist or anything, but at this point, <clears throat> we, we're going to do what we feel like is best for her along with the state, and this is what we decided. So the fact that you're killing someone doesn't... We don't, think it, we don't think it's killing. Yeah. At this point, you've probably noticed that I really fucking hate fascism. Protesters arrested by the NYPD have been pulled aside and asked about anti-fascist sentiments or connections to Antifa. It makes no sense to me that anyone who isn't a fascist would be anti-anti-fascist. If you oppose fascism, then you're technically an anti-fascist. Also, like, K-pop Twitter is a more organized group than Antifa. An FBI report says that they found absolutely no intelligence indicating Antifa involvement. And this was the same day that Trump vowed to designate Antifa a terrorist organization. Designating anti-fascists as terrorists. Hmm. Does anyone still think it's overreacting to be talking about fascism? As early as 2006, the FBI warned of neo-Nazis infiltrating police departments in the US. The reality is that the police exist primarily as a system for managing and even producing inequality by suppressing social movements and tightly managing the behaviours of poor and non-white people, those on the losing end of economic and political arrangements. It's largely a liberal fantasy that the police exist to protect us from the bad guys. As the veteran police scholar David Bailey argues, the police do not prevent crime. This is one of the best kept secrets of modern life. Experts know it, the police know it, but the public does not know it. Yet the police pretend that they are society's best defense against crime and continually argue that if they are given more resources, especially personnel, they will be able to protect communities against crime. This is a myth. We need an effective system of crime prevention in our communities. But this is not what the current system is. This system is better designed to create crime and a perpetual class of people labeled criminals. Saying mass incarceration is an abysmal failure makes sense only if one assumes that the criminal justice system is designed to prevent and control crime. But if mass incarceration is understood as a system of social control, specifically racial control, then the system is a fantastic success. I want to understand y'all. I want to understand all of you. I want to. I deeply want to understand you. I would love to come to your house. I would love to meet your kids. I would love to meet your family. I would love to see the best side of everybody here. Do you want to make a stand? Do you want to make a change? Because if we charge you and you charge us, what is that really doing? What is that really doing? Come on, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, so you might be thinking, sure, the police kind of suck. Let's reform them, right? Hmm. There were some people who wanted to reform slavery and not abolish it. As, therefore, slavery, in some form or other, does exist, will exist, and must exist in the present condition of humanity. 
The next question that demands our consideration is to determine what kind of slavery it should be. What kind will most accord with the laws of nature and the spirit of Christianity? That article was published in July 1863. Wow. I wonder if in 100 or 200 years, we might be at a stage where we'll look back to this time and wonder what the fuck people were thinking. Maybe we will find it just as absurd as those who talked of reforming slavery. Maybe we'll look back at this time and think, what the fuck? I do like thinking of a better future. And I think in this better future, that's what would happen. We would look back at these ideas for reforming the police, and we'd scratch our heads and think, damn, they had it all wrong. Wanting to reform the police kind of presumes that there was something worth saving in the first place. But the police have their roots in racism. And it's not just the roots, it's the roots, the, the bark, the, the branches, the leaves, the, the fruit, the whole fucking tree is rotten. In the immediate aftermath of slavery, the southern states hastened to develop a criminal justice system that could legally restrict the possibilities of freedom for newly released slaves. Black people became the prime targets of a developing convict lease system, referred to by many as a reincarnation of slavery. The prison is considered an inevitable and a permanent feature of our social lives. Most people are quite surprised to hear that the prison abolition movement also has a long history, one that dates back to the historical appearance of the prison as the main form of punishment. In fact, the most natural reaction is to assume that prison activists, even those who consciously refer to themselves as anti-prison activists, are simply trying to ameliorate prison conditions or perhaps to reform the prison in more fundamental ways. Prison abolition is simply unthinkable and implausible. Prison abolitionists are dismissed as utopians and idealists whose ideas are at best unrealistic and impractical, and at worst mystifying and foolish. This is a measure of how difficult it is to envision a social order that does not rely on the threat of sequestering people in dreadful places designed to separate them from their communities and families. The prison is considered so natural that it is extremely hard to imagine life without it. From Angela Davis, from her must-read book, are prisons obsolete. I thought it was a really interesting quote, especially now, when for the first time, seems like a topic that is acceptable in mainstream discourse, much more acceptable than it was just a few months ago. Although, of course, some people still do dismiss the idea as utopian and idealist, many more people are talking about it now than before. The Overton window has shifted. The Overton window describes what subjects of discussion are considered acceptable in mainstream political discourse. This is a great time to keep talking about these subjects. We can't let this die down. Not now that the Overton window has shifted. The most difficult and urgent challenge today is that of creatively exploring new terrains of justice where the prison no longer serves as our major anchor. What we are seeing now are new demands, demands to demilitarize the police, demands to defund the police, demands to dismantle the police and envision uh, different modes of public safety. We're, we're asked now to consider uh, how we might imagine justice in the future. Imagining what the future could look like right now is really, really difficult. But we've got to try. We've got to listen, we've got to learn, we've got to speak up and we've got to imagine. What would the world look like with no police? What would the world look like with no prisons? What would the world look like if we focused more on rehabilitation than punishment? If you like this video, please consider chucking a few dollars towards a black trans woman on Twitter. I've included a link in the description to a Twitter account which retweets black trans women's fundraisers. Uh, so yeah, just chuck a few dollars towards 
a black trans woman, help her out with groceries or rent next month. Thanks. A huge thank you to all of my patrons per usual for supporting me and uh, being patient. A special thanks to Mountain Snow, Reasonably Agitated Honeybee, Erica Abenti, Lunas Nocturne, Moira, Alex Maskell, Hazel, Nellis, Alexandria Chloe, and LPQ Silver. Thank you all so much for helping me to pay my rent. And I'll see you all very soon. <laughs>